the rate we will call the regular meeting of July 17th of the formation committee to order um, we'll call for a roll uh, director Brandt here director Thurlow absent director Geis here uh, the meeting is being recorded as usual and uh, I don't do we, do we have the meet, minutes of June 29th I haven't finished All right. have, well, I'd be happy to show them to you but I don't have a let's go copy. we'll just continue that okay um, any public comment no public comment um, okay item number one consider recommendations regarding obtaining a general manager um, we have some communication from our attorney that um, includes his thoughts on not doing an independent contractor. I'm surprised that you know these recommendations weren't you know part of attorney-client privilege. He talks about litigation in here. I'm surprised that it's part of a public session um, you know this this point this checklist that he provided is you know just typical of the IRS guidelines and the EDD guidelines the real issue you know when you do have an independent contractor is all about paying taxes and getting into you know all the ins and outs of having a regular employee so um, you know, he takes a pretty strong position to not do an independent contractor, and I totally get it. I totally get how the law is written. I totally get what the relationship is with an independent contractor. You know, I've read these guidelines a hundred times in my career. I've dealt with these guidelines a hundred times in my career, and uh, if you're going to have a true independent contractor, it really is a meeting of the minds between um, the you know the board and whoever that independent contractor is you know he gets around and suggests that I don't he brings up CalPERS which is like you know I have a lot of experience with the 1937 Act which is no different than CalPERS and how you can get exposed to you know not paying into a pension fund. I think that's all about the future of how we hire employees of the district and how we, you know, eventually are they are they part of a pension fund? And so that that's a big, big deal. Um, me personally, I don't see in the budget how we can afford a general manager as an employee. There's this other idea that the attorney has that you can just hire him as a volunteer and somehow avoid that the volunteer is an employee I probably would disagree with the attorney that you have just as much exposure under the Fair Labor Standards Act that if somebody is working for us and you're not paying them then you know you you could have just as much exposure um, that you would owe that person back wages as you would not paying their taxes, on top of not paying their taxes and on top of not compensating them. So I just think the whole thing's problematic now to get a general manager. I think if you even get a volunteer, you have to still have that, you, you still have to avoid that employee relationship and it's all up to the board to have the right frame of mind that whoever comes in and works as a general manager is not an employee. And so I, I you know, I look at this advice and I go, it, it just makes it more, it just makes it more difficult um, to put anybody in the place of a general manager. Well, what I'll say, and I'll give my opening comments, and then I want to call Ross because he is available right now and wanted uh, to have some, I think, some remarks. Um, the so, the reason that I included this in the packet and not as part of, you know, just attorney-client privilege is because 
we decided as a committee that we were going to go and seek this advice from him and it was going to be a part of the decision making process and it seemed silly to me to ask for the advice and share it amongst the members of the board but not in the public setting as well i think that this advice is you know i obviously don't have as much experience as you do with, with calpers or with some of these acts but it doesn't seem to me like this is uh something that uh you know i don't see why this had to have been kept with attorney client privilege especially since we were the well, ones who were, well, who were asking for it yeah um but what i will say is that the the two things that he brings up after he goes through the checklist of what makes an independent contractor and what doesn't is that uh, from his perspective, we have two options or well three options really because he says he's obviously the board you know is the decision maker and we can still do this if we want to. It's just that he's advised against it. So what he says is that uh, we could, go forward and uh, try to find a firm and contract with a firm, see if we can get an agreement that's very favorable to us, or we can do the volunteer. And from, you know, like I said, I don't have as much experience with the, you know, some of these fair label, labor laws as you do, but when I read the government code and it says the board shall appoint a general manager and set the rate of compensation, if any, then that says to me that there is definitely a uh, precedent for having a general manager that is uh, not paid and that is a volunteer. Um, and I would imagine that such provision would be put in the code specifically for governments just like ours. So um, I think we should get Ross on the phone and, and maybe you can work out some of your concerns with him. But uh, this to me seems uh, not too far off from what I was expecting him to say, so. You know, that being said, I, I, I can see where you take a very narrow view about how you solve our problem, but, you know, I, I don't think, unless you have a very strong meeting of the minds with the board, that even if you hire a general manager without compensation, just because the law lets you do that, you know, that special district law is written by special districts. And, you know, I, I, get what, I get why it's written that way, but I don't think it trumps the labor laws. Mm -hmm. And if you get into a situation that somebody's working here in an employee capacity and not in a general, true general manager capacity, you're gonna, you're gonna subject yourselves to those other labor laws. And so, you know, you can ask Ross, we can ask Ross, I wrote him this morning and said, how do you get around Fair Labor Standards Act with a volunteer, but... Well, you know, we can ask him right now. How sure. about I get him on the phone? I, I mean, I, I believe we're now in a position that we should we can't hire anybody. Hi, this is Ross. Hey, Ross, how's it going? Hi. Hey, so you are on speakerphone right now with the formation committee. Sorry to put you on the spot just like that, but... Um, That's okay. Uh, we just wanted, we, we had a couple remarks and uh, we wanted to um, uh, get some more of our questions answered. Um, so I'll just let Bob go ahead. Sure. Hey Ross, I sent you a, a, just a couple of things, you know. We're kind of now in a position that, you know, that we put this on the public agenda where this isn't subject to attorney-client privilege. I, I really don't care in that manner. Um, I think it makes it more difficult to um, go down the independent contractor relationship. And you know, I, I probably over my career, I've read this EDD law or the IRS 20 point checklist, Yeah. Uh, you know, a hundred times in my career. I totally get it. I tried to explain early on that if you're gonna do an independent contractor, it has to be a meeting of the minds between the board and the independent contractor, that that independent contractor is a person that is truly independent, similar to you as the attorney, similar to an outside CPA coming in here. Um, very difficult to attain that independent contractor status. You really have to have somebody knowledgeable that 
knows how to come in and be a general manager and you know be truly independent so you know that that it it was my solution in terms of meeting our budgetary requirement and bringing someone in that's more local and understands IV but um, you know I'm more than willing to do something different I just have one a couple of questions one on the volunteer status um, do you really think that works under the Fair Labor Standards Act? Yeah, the Fair Labor Standards Act and California law are consistent that you can't have someone, in, for example, if they're an employee of a, of a private sector, for-profit uh, organization, you, you can't have them volunteer, you know, quote-unquote volunteer, uh, to provide additional services additional activities what have you but when you have a situation where you have someone who is volunteering uh, for a, a public entity uh, the the volunteer status um, that's not the right way to say it the the Fair Labor Standards Act doesn't doesn't apply or doesn't govern in that situation so it, the distinction is someone uh, performing services for a uh, private for-profit commercial versus a, a public entity. Understand. Uh, you know, it, it, the only other thing is, is I don't know if we'd be successful in going out to any one of these firms to get a volunteer. And then if we do get a volunteer, not a volunteer, but someone from a firm I would imagine that comes with some kind of price tag similar to your price tag that we are getting an outsider that is part of the special district association and it's just not but I'm just saying that's not my cup of tea but that's all right right and I, I definitely hear the, the concern about having someone who not only has the knowledge in terms of the execution of the job duties, but also knowledge of, you know, the fairly unique circumstances uh, that the district has. Uh, I, I, that to me is embodied in the fact that they had to pass a special law in order for in order for the district to form. You know, that is very much reflective of the unique uh, situational circumstances for the district, and having someone with that background is going to be very important to successfully carrying out you know the, the job duties just having someone have only one of those two areas covered uh, you know has its own challenges that you know it, at least as far as the concerns I'm hearing isn't going to uh, you know further the district's position in a positive way it, you know, it, ha it runs the risk of getting in the way of the of the policy decisions that uh, the, the board wants to enact yeah, I, that, you know, get, getting in the way is, you know, my, my worry that, you know, we get a seasoned special district bureaucrat that takes us down all those hard paths of employment and a true general manager and all those difficult things that we will face when we truly, if we truly ever get some money to fund the district. And I, I realized the difficulties of getting into, just, just in the financial and accounting and, you know, tax reporting that you're gonna run into, it gets very expensive to uh, bring on employees. You know, you give an example of the, a contract for the worst run entity in the state of California in terms of litigation and lawsuits <laughs> and all those benefits and stuff that have to be included. So, I, right. I mean, I, you know, it's very difficult, the employment part of running a governmental district, but. Yeah, it is. And it, it's compounded by, you know, the financial situation. Uh, you, you, you would have a much easier time recruiting someone who has sufficient knowledge in the carrying out the job duties and sufficient knowledge of the of the community to be able to act effectively uh, if you could entice somebody 
you know, the, the suggestions that I keep running into, because whenever I have a chance, you know, I'm, I'm hitting my network of people and asking, you know, what, what would you do? Where would you go? And the, I won't say overwhelming, but I will say the consistent response I get is, is to get somebody who is a retired administrator, um, you know, who has enough knowledge uh, to be able to at least have a foundation for representing this particular entity and ask them if they'll do a couple of months, um, you know, pro bono. And, you know, I want to, I want to make sure that the, that the committee is, is not getting too bogged down in this because on the one hand, you know, we're talking about independent contractor and on the other hand, we're talking about an employment, you know, agreement or an employment contract and, the real difficulty in all of this comes with somebody who's got CalPERS. And if we get somebody who has their pension benefits, you know, or CalPERS or some other, uh, you know, locally administered on, you know, on a county level or what have you, some other retirement plan, the last thing that they want to do is jeopardize their pension position. So, you know, we have to be careful about calling it an employment agreement or we have to be careful about a, you know, an independent contractor type of position. But ultimately, from a practical standpoint, whatever it is that we end up calling it, it has to be written in such a way that if our best candidate is someone who's a retiree, that their pension benefits aren't going to be affected in any way. And uh, if that ends up coming down to a, a contract or a memorandum of understanding or a, a memorandum of agreement that looks a little bit like an independent contractor contract and looks a little bit like an employment contract, you know, that may just be the, the best uh, solution that we're going to be able to come up with given the very unique circumstances here. But going back to your comment, uh, Director Geis, about you know, meeting of the minds, th that's accurate. We, we need to make sure that the person contemplated or the, the role that's contemplated specifically spells the requirements are going to be in terms of servicing the district, the knowledge, etc. But it also needs to be very clear that this isn't designed in such a way as to equate to employment in the sense of benefits, in the sense of money, that we need a subject matter expert to give pro bono hours to be able to help the district get to a point where it can support somebody on a, on a more permanent basis. And I think if the agreement does that, it's, it's going to be the best fit um, for, for where we are. And it's going to draw a little bit from looking like, you know, a labor MOU with the with the labor group, and it's going to have a little bit from an independent contractor uh, agreement. It's going to have a little bit from an employment agreement. And in the end, yeah. if the if the if the solution is we we just have to craft a tool of best fit, then as long as we document all of the reasons why we're taking that approach then that's going to be the best level of risk mitigation that we're going to be able to achieve. And, and given the unique circumstances, I'm very, I'm very much aware of the fact that we're not going to be able to secure you know, 100% confidence in one way or the other. It's just, I don't think that's a, uh, something that's achievable with the set of circumstances that the district is dealing with on this issue. Hey, Ross, just... What maybe just for the the directors and the public who are in the room, would you say that the let's say you you, you have a independent contractor relationship? To me, the risk there is that you don't pay the employees taxes at the state and federal level. I mean, I think that's what the EDD checklist is all about. That's what the 20 point IRS checklist all about. So your risk is that you pay somebody a stipend and then that really is, you should have paid federal and state income taxes on it. As, as opposed to, you know, as a volunteer, the risk is that that volunteer someday comes to you and says, well, you know, I was really an, an employee and you should pay me a wage and I guess you protect that with an agreement that they're a true volunteer and then I, I don't know I, I just 
see that, who, what, what, what other risks are out there? I mean, we talk about litigation and somebody's going to come in and say, well, you know, they're going to, somebody from the public is going to challenge that we aren't paying federal and state taxes on an employee or we're not paying an employee. What do you see as the risks there? Sure. And the, I think in addition to the concerns that you articulated, the, the other major statutory concerns are whether uh, all the wage and hour laws have been followed. When you're talking about a volunteer, you don't have to worry about uh, compliance with those laws. Uh, uh, meal times, breaks, yeah. right. hour limits, you know, that kind of a thing. You, you have a, a lot more flexibility in a volunteer situation than you do uh, with, a, with an employee situation. So if a determination is made after the fact, then you would owe, you know, back, uh, back wages and, you know, there are statutory penalties that are assigned with violations of the wage and hour laws uh, and also attorney's fees. So if someone, the, the attorneys for the would-be plaintiff, they get their fees paid. And a lot of times that could be the uh, primary risk factor in, in the analysis on how to mitigate the risk. It's Try not to court a lawsuit because you're going to pay for the other attorney's fees in addition to your own. On terms of who's going to have standing to, to, to bring it, the, the primary risk there is the person who's involved. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> I would have to look, but I don't believe off the top of my head necessarily that a member of the public is going to be in a position to have standing to bring a lawsuit unless they try and go through some type of a private attorney general statute, like, a, what is that, 1021.5 of the Code of Civil Procedure, I believe that it is, uh, allows for a, t a, attorney, a private attorney general situation where members of the public can act on behalf of uh, the public in certain situations. But typically it has to be a matter of you know, broad concern, statewide concern, uh, a matter of uh, uh, public policy that impacts an, a large number of individuals, you know, something along those lines. Uh, you know, and the, the, other, the other concern, a little bit farther down, the risk, uh, the risk triage or the risk uh, matrix, if you will, is that, you know, it, it, it provides uh, a window to on whether anybody else wants to come in and challenge any of the other relationships, like the interns. And, you know, I, I don't think necessarily there's anything there, but, you know, I, I want to be clear that risk isn't just if you get a lawsuit and you might lose. It's the fact that if you court a lawsuit, you know, either actively or, or passively, that that is time that is taken away from the directors and trying to carry it out the responsibilities on the policy side, and it's also time and money potentially spent in just having to respond. Uh, it's not even just the adverse consequences, uh, potential adverse consequences of a of a negative ruling uh, or a, you know, a negative judgment, or something along those lines. It's a, it's a resource drain is is part of the risk. When I say risk mitigation, I'm also considering that factor. So, you know, those are the primary risks, wage and hour uh, determinations uh, against the district, uh, opening up a uh, potential lawsuit against, you know, other relationships like the internship program. You know, since I'm still getting up to speed on how all of that's going on, um, you know, I don't have uh, the ability to say one way or the other to give you a, a strong uh, opinion or advice on that. I can only give you kind of uh, generalities or broad strokes. Uh, and then the other factors that you mentioned as well about uh, uh, taxes being paid. Yeah. But can I just ask one more thing on your worry about the CalPERS and the pensions? You know, I'm a 1937 Act employee, which their laws are pretty um, uh, parallel with the CalPERS Act. Right. And, you know, I... I in a retired status would only jeopardize my pension if I worked as an employee for somebody for more than 900 hours. Yep, so, 960 hours, yep. So yeah, I'm just limited in terms of the hours that I can put in. Um, 
But it doesn't even, if, it, if I'm in an independent contractor relationship, those, that, that, that's, those 960 hours don't even apply. My only exposure working more than, you know, making more than $15,000 in an independent contractor relationship is only on my um, social security if I've drawn that pension. And then you just lose a dollar for dollar on what you've done. So I don't, I don't, I don't know what the worry is about hiring somebody in a CalPERS pension situation unless they have multiple agreements with multiple, you know, entities. My my concern would be is if a, an adverse determination is made against the the contractor or the employee that categorizes them uh, in such a way that their time spent on behalf of the district can be used to affect their pension formula. Yeah, but because, that would have you know, to be pension more... Formula, and, and again, I'm not an expert in, in, in pensions, but my, my general understanding is that your end uh, wage is what is used to calculate your eventual uh, pension benefits. And if you take enter into a relationship that impacts your wage determination in a negative way, it can have the effect of decreasing your pension. Here, if the, if the dollar value is zero, CalPERS finds that they were an employee, and CalPERS decides that this is a great way for them to save a little bit of money, not having to pay out a pension to this to the person who decides, and you know, for <laughs> to, to, to do some volunteer work or to, to help out the district. And, CalPERS comes down and says, no, you're actually an employee, and you violated our rules, and because you got paid zero, we're going we're gonna to recalculate your pension determination and pay you less. I, I, I've never heard of a situation like that. Well, I've heard, I've heard of situations of, of pension payouts being, uh, being impacted by a uh, working relationship and where a different a dollar value was paid, and there's a there was discussion about of recalculation of their pension benefits, and you know most retirees are very proactive about this, so that's one component. Is we don't want to scare away all the all the fish. Uh, if they smell anything that's going to look like a reduction in, in pension benefits or any potential impact yeah. on their on pension benefits, understandably so. People have worked a long time, worked very hard to get those pension benefits. The other aspect of it is is that they do enter enter it. And through a set of circumstances that is not typical, but everything with the district so far hasn't exactly been typical, then that uh, puts our, our good-natured person uh, who's coming in to help us out in a position of having to defend you know, their, their CalPERS position or their retirement uh, pension position. So I've, I've seen disputes about the, the calculation based on work taken subsequent to retirement. That's that's the basis of the concern. Likelihood of something like that happening, you know, who knows? That there are a lot of variables. Uh, a lot of things would have to go, you know, down a, a certain set of paths. In, in trying to move the issue forward, I would go back to what I, I said before. I think that the I think that the agreement that we come to, or the the document that we come to, is going to have elements from. The three major types of, of labor agreements that you have. You know, with an organized bargaining unit, there might be some uh, provisions that are going to help us uh, achieve the, the goal of getting somebody on board. Provisions from an independent contractor type of a contract, provisions from uh, an employment agreement. Well, Such that we, we have that clear meeting of the minds, as you pointed out rightly at the very beginning, that this is a pro bono slash volunteer position. There are no pay, there's no pay, there, there's no benefits, there's no workers' compensation, uh, you know, except as might be required by law. And you know, we need you for X period of time in this administrative capacity, and we need somebody who knows the, the issues in the community. Well, I think we're just to the same point that it's very difficult to go out and do the solicitation when we 
don't know who the individual was and how, how do you get that solicitation out there with an original understanding by the board of who we're trying to hire you know right you know i i don't i you know i've been into districts that have hired retired administrators and what they're good at is acting as a administrator of a district that has money resources yes. programs strategic plans or they help you with that strategic plan i think in the needs of our district we need somebody that helps us get through this startup period that's good at helping us get grants helping us work with ucsb helping us with um, the community and the community involvement to develop our district which is kind of you know I'm looking for a community activist that has a general skill level that helps us do things that I'm not even good at, which is like getting a grant. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, and as, as far as that's concerned, you know, there, there are really two parts to that. One's the policy position, you know, and that's, that's not my function to weigh on, in on the policy. I can tell you that a lot of the legal issues that I've been running into and in trying to assist the district have been related to the fact that the, the financial situation is what it is. And as you pointed out, having someone who uh, is skilled enough to deal with the concerns that the district has as a function of financing, uh, I can tell you that that will have a direct impact on the ability for the district to navigate a lot of the legal hurdles. But in terms of the prioritization of community interest and community knowledge over you know the financial side that's more of a policy decision for the board uh, for the committee to to discuss first and then to take it to the board for the full board's consideration yeah well i just want to say that i i think one of the things that you included ross in your uh communication with us um is because we spent a lot of time talking about the weeds of what volunteer versus independent contractor or versus employee looks like but this idea of of getting temporary assistance from an existing firm you know I'm not convinced that we can't get uh, local advisement and local involvement in an existing firm or something to that effect and because Ross correct me if I'm wrong but it seems like the one thing that would have the best legal standing and would put us in the best position legally would be if we were contracting with a firm. Yes, that's that's correct. So I think that the we have these options on the table and as Ross has kind of explained to us, none of them are pretty insofar as we're not going to get a solution that is going to be um, you know, clear cut and is going to satisfy every little need that we can come up with given our financial situation. Um, and the drawback, of course, of the, the firm is whether or not they want to do it. Why don't we just ask to begin with? This is one of the things that Ross suggests in his letter. He says, uh, you know, we might just be able to call Campa, see what they have to say, see if they're willing to uh, give us some assistance during these difficult times and I think that there would be a lot of community interest in wanting to help whatever firm or whatever person it is that we hire uh, have that have that knowledge and, and have that ability to navigate the community so that is really what I'm leading towards at this point um, further down the road you know if, if they just give us a fat no then you know we should we'll be we'll have to go and, and consider the the volunteer aspect I think that's my priorities right now what do you think I, I, I understand these firms I understand they're you know retired employees that are looking to secure work and make money after their retirement you know I don't know if you get them to do it for free. I, I, you can ask, but 
I, I know what you're going to get. You're going to get, you know, you might get a government bureaucrat to help us out. And if that's what we think is the right solution, that's the technical way we need to do this. But it's worth asking, but I'm, I'm, it's not my cup of tea. I think that given that it would put us in the best legal position and that given there have been so we've been placed under a microscope like no public agency in ILO's to history given that I think that it is worth it for us to at least solicit some sort of help I, I think it's fine if, if the board wants to go solicit help from this organization then that's up to the board I'm just saying that that's not my cup of tea. My cup of tea is I'd rather find a volunteer in the community that, you know, works as an independent contractor and that, you know, if we can afford to pay them a stipend, we pay them a stipend and in an independent contractor relationship. I think that you can have someone come in and tell our board what to do as an advisor. And it might be on, you know, it might not be, it could be somebody that's not, doesn't have a great deal of experience, but they have good common knowledge to work like we are as the board to, to get things done for the district. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need a bureaucratic administrator to come in and tell us how to run a district when we don't have any money. I mean, he, they're they're gonna they're gonna do it for a future, you know. They're gonna be interim, but they're gonna want to get paid at some point. I, I doubt if they're just gonna want to just hang out and work for free in Isla Vista if they don't belong. They're not a member of the community. I don't know. I don't get it. Okay. So and again, recognizing the thing that we must not forget, which is that we've already. If there's one thing we can agree on is that none of these solutions are gonna be pretty. None of them. There are there is no silver bullet in this discussion. Sure, I think if you get the right volunteer to come in and act as the general manager, it, it that's where we, that's where we are going the whole time. Now we get afraid of employment laws and that relationship because we go to this twenty point checklist and we're looking at not that's not my vision of what we were trying to engage someone to do, not to be an employee but to be an advisor to the district, just like Ross is an advisor to the district. Uh, now, he comes with we a license. We contract with the firm, though. Uh, I, I, I agree, but I don't, I'm not hung up on a firm. I think you can get I'm somebody with an independent, uh, but if you get somebody with an independent relationship that understands the agreement they're getting into, I think it works. But you have to find that right person that gets <laughs> the legality of the 20 point checklist and that they're not an employee and they have to operate very independently to give us advice to tell us to, to help us move along the district but that's just that's just I can think that way because I've been in that situation so I get it you know I was the independent auditor for a long time so I know what independence is I being a CPA I get independence Finding that individual on the other side, I understand everything that Ross is saying that that's a difficult level to get to. That's my preference to, to get someone like that. But I'm, so I'm willing to go You're saying your preference is for a volunteer My is, is my, not compensated. My preference was a volunteer that if we could afford a stipend, we'd give him a stipend. But I think we've lost Ross. Um, that's just... That was just my preference from the beginning. But well, so at the point that we're at now. Go ask the firm. Oh, okay. But well, I just want to make something clear, which is that at the point that we're at now, we've solicited advice from our legal counsel. He has replied to us with advice. And the, the option at this point, in my mind, of going forward with an independent contractor we pay a stipend is not on the table. 
Okay, we that's have received, not, we have received that's your vote. Advice. It's not on the table. That's fine. Well, we go forward with the firm. We've solicited advice from our legal counsel. I get I get the advice from our legal counsel. I've read it a hundred times. I I understand thoroughly what the issue is, probably better than he does. Well, you are not acting as our legal counsel. Well, I'm not your legal counsel. I'm just a director. I I know. Fine. <clears throat> so, what? I don't, I don't see why we can't go forward with asking a firm, soliciting from firms, and also, in the meantime, having Ross prepare a draft agreement for, or it sounds like it would be an MOU between a, uh, a volunteer and the district. Because it seems to me at this point, you know, we, I don't know how much longer we can continue to operate without that general manager. It's just, it's becoming very difficult. And I think that it will be better to explore all our options as are on the table, as provided to us by legal counsel, than to focus too far in on anyone. It's fine. I'll, I'll vote for that. Okay. All right. All of that. The, um, but, but that comes with a caveat that, you know, that firm may not get my vote as, you know, it, it, I, I, it, I, we have to look very carefully at entering into an agreement with a firm. I agree. I really do. I agree. Here, let me. <clears throat> Hi, Ross. Sorry about that. That's okay. Not a problem. Uh, I don't know what I missed. Uh, I think the last thing that I heard was a uh, discussion of none of the options are very pretty, um, but something along the lines of the best fit. That's yeah. I think I, yeah. So, at, at so this, Ross, let, let me let me just ask you a question in your legal advice. Sure. Do you think the concept of a volunteer who acts as an independent contractor and and I guess we suggest that that would just be done with an MOU, and if we could ever afford to pay them a stipend, do you say that's taboo and you couldn't pay them a stipend? Uh, if you're going to pay them a stipend, then I don't believe that they're a volunteer anymore. I think that's one of the one of the points that they talk about in the wage and hour laws. Uh, that if if you're looking at if you're looking at someone volunteering and providing for free services that they rendered in the capacity of a paid employee, that's not okay. If you're going to have someone act in a volunteer capacity and you pay them some type of a stipend. My recollection is, is that that starts to bend it away from a volunteer situation. I'd have to look at the, the provisions of the California and the federal laws I'm thinking of, but um, I would say that that's probably uh, probably not something you know that I would recommend. Okay. My recommendation, my, my advice is that we we make an, an agreement and recognizing it's gonna it's gonna look a little bit like an independent contractor it's gonna look a little bit like an MOU it's gonna look a little bit like an employment agreement that we're really looking at uh, to mitigate the risk that's out there it's just gonna ha we're gonna have to craft a tool of best fit and now if the policy decision of the board is to go at an independent contractor you know way that I will make an agreement that I, that I can, to the best of our ability, from a legal standpoint, meets that policy objective, if it's at all possible. I can tell you that I've been checking with people and nobody has heard of you know, a situation where an individual acts as an independent contractor in this type of, a, of an executive type of a position. They've all been employment agreements unless you've ha hired an outside firm. That being said, We've got a lot of smart people, and we'll do our best. Well, I get, I get, you know, we, we can come up with an employment agreement, you know, quote-unquote employment agreement, that is going to say, you know, it's going to lay out all the requirements and basically spell out that it's going to be for free. Uh, 
you know, then that's, then that's the way that, that we will end up going. Um, so it's, there's no, there's no, there's no good answer. There's no clean answer. Uh, as Spencer said, you know, none of them are the, are the prettiest options. Right. Um, well, I, I can tell you that the director of LAFCO for Santa Barbara County, who is a general manager, is an independent contractor. He works okay. under a firm. No. Well, he, he, has, he, a, he, he has a firm. He has one client himself. Well, he has one client. But he still has so a firm. So he formed an LLC. Correct. He's done. It's a piece of paper. Correct. But that's not what we're talking about. Well, you, he, well I'm saying whatever volunteer we could do that, we could require him to be an LLC. And, you know, I, he, Ross says there's nobody that's an independent contractor. That's not true. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know of... It's not the best agreement in the world. I don't even think it's a good agreement with the county. There's exposure there, just like you're saying, whatever agreement we get into. But, you know, Spencer wants to go down this route of hiring a firm. I'd say the board can go down that route and see what it gets. I'm just saying, whoever you get from that firm may or may not be my cup of tea. Sure. This is just me. And, and to the point about the the, you know, the natural person versus the a, a corporate entity, you know, from a practical standpoint, Director Geish, you're, you're right. That is an individual. Um, you know, they only have one client. You know, that kind of a thing. But in in terms of the, the way that the law shakes out, is there's a huge distinction between having a corporate entity and contracting with that corporate entity. You don't have the same issues with wage and hour laws, so that's that's why that gets. I, I agree. And if you wanted to require that person to have a corporate entity and to contract that corporate entity, you know, in my mind, that significantly changes the you know the calculus in a way that may be beneficial. Um, but uh, you know, at least at, at this point, um, I can answer any last questions. But otherwise, I need to yeah. uh, I need to but hop off here. Ross, it's not it's not very difficult to to form a corporate entity for an individual, correct? That's correct. It's yeah. it is a couple of pieces of paper. It's a commitment yeah. to pay eight hundred dollars a year in taxes. Yeah. If you're not making any money, uh, I think the filing fees are forty five or eighty five dollars, something along those lines. It's it's not a difficult process. I've yeah. formed uh, a number of LLCs in my time. And okay. Anybody with two hours and uh, access to LegalZoom can make a corporate uh, an LLC. Okay. Well, with that, Ross, I want to thank you for your time and your patience on this issue. I know it's not the prettiest issue. It's, it's um, not an easy issue, and the fact that the, you know there's a discussion about all of this is, is perfectly understandable. So, uh, you know, in the end, know that I'm here to help implement the policy decision that the, the committee and the board makes. That's my ability. That's great, and we thank you a lot for that. Yeah, cool. Okay. All right, Bye, Ross. Right. We'll talk to you later. Okay. So. Um, I think that I think that when when I say that we should be looking for firms, I don't want you to think that we just want to limit it to Canva. Um, obviously, that's the one I'm most familiar with and that uh, I've looked up to most. But um, there are definitely others that exist out there, and you know, I'm not entirely opposed to this idea of someone forming an LLC and us contracting with that LLC because I think that it serves sort of the same purpose. But I also want us to understand that, you know, as this committee, when we bring recommendations to the full board, because these decisions are decisions that really affect the like future of the district and are important decisions, the full board is not going to rubber stamp whatever we recommend. And I have concerns about trying, the main thing that I think I had against the interim general manager that started to develop was that I wasn't sure that we were going to get support at the full board level for something like that, given the way that it went the last time that we brought it. So I think that in the best interest of, uh, in the best interest of of trying to get something in place as quickly as possible, we should ex be exploring all of our options. And I think, uh, you know, I agree with you 100% that I'm not going to, you know, enter into an agreement with the firm just because they're there. 
I think that it has to be the right person. I agree with you 100% that it is ideal to get someone from the community at this point because of our situation and because of the fact that one of the main things that is the, the variable in some of these agreements is whether or not the person who we've entered into an agreement with decides to speak up and say something. And I think that we're gonna get you know less of, I think it's a lot uh, less likely that we end up with a grievanced employee or, or someone who tries to make a quick buck off of us if they have that community buy-in. And I think you agree with me on that. And that's probably one of the reasons why you're so interested in that. So I would move that we uh, recommend that the full board uh, solicit uh, proposals for um, the services of general manager from various firms and that we uh, ask our legal counsel to begin drafting an agreement both for uh, firms and for uh, volunteers. with the understanding that these are two distinct options and that neither are the ideal option. And that we really need to be exploring all avenues at this point. Would that include, when you say firms, would that include soliciting individuals that could form their own firm? Well, I think that a prerequisite in my mind you know, I, I don't want, you know, us to go out and contact someone and say, hey, can you make a firm? Uh, I'd rather them do that on their own volition. I'll second. Okay. Do you want me to repeat that again? Yes. Okay. Um, I moved to uh, recommend that the board of directors solicit services of general manager from qualified firms and that we direct legal counsel to prepare two agreements, one for a contract between a, the board and a firm and one for a contract of the board and a volunteer. Do we want both agreements before we, should we go down the firm route before we go to the, down the volunteer route? I certainly think so. I think that it would be good for us to uh, recommend this work now. It seems to me like, you know, he was talking about an MOU for a volunteer. I would certainly want to know what's in that MOU so I know what level of urgency we need to be pursuing the firm with because you know, I know we've had problems with MOUs in the past, and I don't want us to get bogged down at the full board by MOU wars. So that's just more of a secondary concern. I just think there's really no issue with front-loading some of this stuff. And as Ross has communicated to us, he gets uh, the level of attention that we are putting to this. And that's why he <laughs> stayed on the phone with us for an hour right now. Did you get it? All right. Yeah, can you uh, read it back to us? It says, motion to recommend that the board of directors solicit services of a general manager from qualified firms and that we direct legal counsel to prepare two agreements, one for contract between the board and a firm, one for a contract of the board and a volunteer. So now we're going out to all the firms do we want to also solicit volunteers at the same time? So that if you, if, so that we've gone down both routes to see which is the best solution? Well, I want to be able to, I think, keep our options open. But if we don't, if we don't know what our options are in terms of the volunteers versus hiring a firm, don't, Shouldn't we go down a parallel path and have both to measure against? Yeah, okay, I think that that's fine. So could we do just a friendly amendment to 
Uh, include solicit uh, solicit the services of general manager from qualified firms and volunteers. Yeah. Okay. That good? That's fine by me. And you know, depending on what happens, I think that this idea of of an individual who has an LLC could be really promising. Because I don't know what the viability of us getting uh, a firm like Campa to yeah. do pro bono work for us is. I would imagine it's pretty low. Right. But I think that it's worth exploring. Yeah. Those, those, those guys are retired, you know, but it's, it's like there's plenty of retired fire chiefs around that <laughs> go work 900 hours somewhere and make a lot of money in retirement. Yeah, no, I understand. It. It's just that if there is an issue, we don't have yeah. any money to pay for it. Yeah, right. All right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That was a long discussion. That was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I appreciate it, Bob, and I appreciate your knowledge that you bring to this topic. It's well, certainly well beyond the realm of it's of just what It's I know. just hard to get somebody in the mindset that they're truly an independent contractor. I, you've got to really get the issue to get it. But it is, and it's, and it's not something that we, unfortunately, can truly control. Yeah, and you can't teach somebody that sometimes. But no. anyways, okay. So develop revenue-raising strategies and plans. Um, I think we want to continue to discuss strategies to raise revenue. I don't know how the $3,000 grant application is going, but I thought it was... Um, was that Supervisor Carbajal's representative at the last Board of Directors meeting? Yeah, so what he had mentioned is um, something from, I think it was the National Endowment for Humanities. Yeah. Um, and I actually haven't had a chance to go and, and look into some of these details. Um, but um, that sounded, certainly sounds like something that's very interesting. Um, my understanding is that they provide grants for various, uh, you know, like community-based, um, I think there's, you know, some Art stuff, obviously, humanities, but I think that um, this could be something that would mesh really well uh, with programming in the community center eventually or in some other facility. Right. So, so, so it's, it's certainly something to be keeping in mind. So the, the, the question gets to be on that particular 1,000 to 25,000, is that something we would want to ask the board to assign a director? I mean, you know, maybe we can take some public comment here. I don't know how familiar Jonathan is with this, but maybe um, Jonathan would like to weigh in on this fundraising opportunity, or I don't know how familiar you are with it. I thought you made a comment at the board meeting. Oh yeah, Elijah has been talking about this one with me for a while, just because he's work he's the staff member working on it in the, in his office, but I don't know. The specific grants that are in it, and aren't they going to have a workshop yeah. soon? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what Elijah's planning is the workshop. Oh, he's going to run the workshop. He's not running it, but he's been coordinating it. He's coordinating the workshop. Yeah. Okay. Well, we should definitely have a representative, probably from our committee there, if we want to. Now that we're talking about this in the committee, it should probably stay in here. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'd certainly be happy to go once it's. That, that'd be great. I'd recommend that, you know, Director Brandt, um, you know, go to the, you know, to the, to the, um, what do we just call it? Yeah, it's the National Endowment for the Humanities. Yeah, to go, to the, go to the yeah. workshop. And of course, and I'll bring whatever I find out back here. For development and of a any, proposal. Yeah. We could start the development of a proposal to take to the full board. Yeah. Okay. So... I don't but think we need a, a motion for that. But we don't? Yeah. But to assign you? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, so motion to assign Director Brandt to attend the workshop and bring back to the committee any information. Second. All in favor? Oh, public comment? We forgot to ask that on the one before that. <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. So then on the formation committee, the guiding document, I don't know if we ever, we still ha had that product from the mm, Yeah, and I'm maybe. sorry, I keep on forgetting to bring this. Yeah. I I'll, went on 
print well, I'll just put that on the next one and yeah. give you a reminder when we do the yeah, agenda. I swear that it exists. I know. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And then on the uh, travel to suite 101, we don't have the keys. And I originally had the keys um, loaned to me by Gina. I could ask Gina for the keys again so that we could tour at our next meeting. Um, or hopefully the agreement would be done, but yeah so i mean the next meeting would be well it would be the 7th of august but you know there may be a necessity for us to have a special meeting uh depending on what the board decision is uh in between that time because the the next two mondays from now is the 31st of july which is the 5th of july so we this is i think going to be something we're gonna have to talk about in future uh meeting dates but May want to schedule a special meeting. Do we know at the county is the county taking that agreement to the board, or do they are they still trying to do it internally? Well, we don't know. No. I don't think the agreement's getting taken to the board. All I know is that, and this is just what I heard for the grapevine, is that everything at the county is super backed up because of the fire, and so that's kind of what we're waiting on. Right. Um, okay. So let's. I think. Can we could we can we notice a special meeting in that room? In the room, that right next if door. we get the keys to the room, can we notice a special meeting at that location and just have a special meeting there to work on workspace? I certainly think so. I think that, that would be that would probably be ideal because then we wouldn't have to deal with uh, uh, we wouldn't have to deal with you know moving the recording equipment and stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, we can put the recording equipment in there. Um, Jay, does that work? It, recording equipment's portable? I don't think he's going to respond. He's not going to yeah. respond? Yeah. All right. Good call. <laughs> um, so let's see. I see that the emerging needs grant is still on the agenda. Is, is there something else that we needed to, to do in regards to that? I, I don't think so, unless we have any comment from the public and Jonathan Do you want to give us an input? update Jonathan? It's turned in. It's turned in? As oh cool. Critic, so, All right. Uh, I saw Ethan and George in San Francisco when I was there too. Like, <laughs> Are you good with this? And we finished it. So uh, Elena has it and she said that she'll take a look and get back to me as soon as she can. So. All right. Cool. They, do, they say it's a week which is when you're supposed to get it. So if I don't hear back from her by Wednesday I'll check in to see because I asked her some questions, I'm like, is this sufficient? I'm like, it's three pages long, and she wanted two pages, so I just couldn't cut enough. So I said, do you already shorten it more? So okay. I'll see if she wants me to continue doing that. But okay, very cool. She does. All right, that's great. So we'll take no action on that. Then consider recommendations regarding administrative needs of the office space. Um, discuss and formulate an inventory of office supplies, equipment, and services for use in an IBCSD office. So, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we, if you know, we talked about trying to get university surplus property either as a contribution or a donation. I think maybe that should be our first alternate is to try and see what they have available, and that becomes the original, you know, hard stuff we want, which is yeah. desks and chairs and. Um, you know, before we make, you know, I think we should, we, we need to get in there and contemplate having a little server room or something, or a place where we can secure computers or have some kind of computer that has more memory and capacity that acts as a storage device. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, back in that room there definitely is a closet back there that i think could be a good security area and you know we just have to make sure that the ventilation and stuff is good there and that back room is really not unless you want to you know it, it probably is workable as it is we just would be on um, cement floors and you know this was a cement floor for a long time before it got yeah. started up so i think it just needs cleaned up and cleared out and I don't know when the, I don't know where the county, they're using that as like their cleaning supply room and stuff, or there's they a bunch are. of junk in there, but That's maybe great. not. 
It's just that's seems, always what happens with empty offices, right? Yeah. You just throw a bunch of crap in there. Right. Yeah. And so I guess my only other point about this is I'm not very good at devising workspace. There were people in my office that did that, and they did it really nicely and professionally, and it worked for a long period of time. I kind of worry a little bit, because we're IV, that it took a long time to get this room into the condition it's in, because the county brought some money and really rehabbed it. Mm -hmm. And originally, we did it in a nice way for the redevelopment agency that we really had concrete floors, we did get basic painting done. You know, we were able to bring in, I think, this furniture and stuff. And so it's been around for a while. But, you know, people think, from IB, these are great chairs. Yeah. <laughs> and I've sat yeah. in these chairs for 25 years and my legs go numb. <laughs> but, you know, it's just the same thing over there. The only recommendation I can give is, for everything that goes in there, we want to do it nice. We want to yeah. do it, of course, professionally. Because, 100%. but you know, you can get the attitude to bring in the couches like this really easy. Even though I've got used to the couches and they're really nice, <laughs> but you well, know, I think these these couches aren't even county property. This is IVRPDs, from my understanding. Right, and they've and, been sitting here for a long time. Yeah, and so you can end up in IV with IV furniture. And so I just would caution us to be careful what we put in there. And oh, I agree one hundred percent. I don't want to put in junky stuff. Yeah. This is our first office. You know, we are. It'll be our first physical presence in the community that is permanent. Yeah. And there's no reason for us to. You know, we need to put our best foot forward. I, I agree. And so, so I, I think we ought to assign a couple of board of directors, just two, to. Two. Be in charge of putting the environment together in there. And like, you know, I, I'm not that director because I don't have a very good vision for paint colors. Uh, you know, I, in the auditor's office, I was the executive director only of the art committee. <laughs> and that means we just hung some art on the wall. That's smart, yeah. But it all came from everybody else. Yeah. I never was one to determine the pictures on the budget covers, the pictures on the financial statements. And so that's just not my cup of tea. But I don't know if you're pretty good at it. You guys designed a really nice poster and stuff. You made it professional, you know, on the, on oh, the big uh -huh. logo. Yeah. And so if there's a couple of directors that are, that you think we ha you got some of that talent, then I'd say be in charge couple people to make the decisions so that we don't have to come to the full board about what kind of desk yeah are we that kind of stuff I did you know well I mean accepting property accepting donations might be something that has to come to the board but in terms of like the yeah putting <coughs> pictures up on the wall that stuff that's like administrative <coughs> stuff that should not come to the board <laughs> yeah those right. are uh, low level but it'd be decisions. nice if somebody was in charge of you know, not not just moving in the <coughs> finding a piece of furniture on the street and moving it into there. Somebody yeah. needs to be in charge of the I physical agree. space. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, it sounds like um, you know, once we have office space, I would imagine that uh, Director Bertrand will be working out of there in terms of managing that community right. room when we have the, the key system set up and yada yada yada. Because that's a big component, I think, of. Uh, how the office is going to get set up in the beginning is that its main use will be as the housing place of these keys. And so in any event, what I was hoping, I think, originally to do with this agenda item was that we would just have sort of a checklist of the stuff that we need and eventually, you know, we can just hand this off to, um, you know, you guys on the, on the finance committee you can purchase the stuff. Um, so, so let me... Or we'll have this document, and if someone wants to donate us, you know, a bunch of pens or something, or you know, some keyboards. So, you know, so I think that, and my idea. It's like a wedding. It's like a wedding list. And my, like my idea is is, you, the the big things we need to talk about are, are we going to hang a TV in there? Are we going to hang, you know, so we don't have to. You know, are we going to hang a TV? Are we going to have a hang a whiteboard? Are we going to hang a, 
um, you know, have a copier, a place for a copier in there? Are we going to have, you know, those are the, I think we should think of the big things first. Okay. That little stuff of pens and papers and, you know, is a trip to Staples and somebody, you know, buying stuff. So, okay. What do you think about whiteboard? You know, I eventually in, um, in my office installed whiteboards everywhere because that's the way we went up there. You know, and then we got into the electronic whiteboards and they kind of were passe and didn't, you know, you capture a picture and that didn't <laughs> work that well. Okay. And so, interesting. but it just depends in a working office. I always, I, old school, I always used a whiteboard or that was a reminder thing, you know, but um, I, I don't know what you guys think. You know, you guys are so much better at technology and yeah. using the computers that, you know, that's kind of, a whiteboard might be not part of the organization anymore. That might be <coughs> really old school. I mean, I, I certainly like whiteboards. I know we have a huge one hung up in my house, but, um, you know, I, I think that if we, that's something that's a lot more feasible to me than an electronic whiteboard or than a, uh, a TV. Because I don't want to, at this point, essentially, you know, even though we haven't approved our budget, you know, we kind of have to work within the parameters of that uh, budget allocation and then appropriate those funds to specific things so, uh, or make recommendations for that. But um, I don't see the funds in there to get a TV. Um, we, so the other. Um, I'm sure we could so get a TV donated. Well, we could. So, and again, so the think of this like a wedding registry. Maybe we should have a list of things that we bring to the board and we say, these are the things that we would like for office space. And right. if people want to jump in, pitch everything in, right. then we can get the stuff together. So do we want to, is there anything specific that we would want included on that list? TV sounds like one. A, a flat screen that, you know, that you could work off of. Okay. I, I think consideration of a whiteboard and be taking up a wall, you know, if you do it. Um, you know, the Some question, filing cabinets? Uh, mm, well, that's another, we were talking about, it's a spatial thing. It's so, a, uh, but we should have filing cabinets because we will have records. It's a question of how big they are and where they go. Yeah, it's a question of how many, you know, and how yeah. much are you going to get into electronic record keeping versus paper record keeping. Okay. And so... Well, and we do have paper records of some things, so we do have to keep those. Right. So, I mean, we'll, how about we'll put an asterisk next to the filing cabinets? Yeah. I, I, think, I think computers and computer storage is, is, is a big deal. I think we could have a good technical discussion of the board. Do we want to own, you know, any kind of recording devices like that are used in this um, office? So I, I don't know. And then I think we should put something down about, you know, the security devices. Do we want? Do we want to have security in there? Well, I think the county might have an alarm system, if that's what you're thinking of. I'm talking, do we want to record all the activity that's happening in okay. the room? Okay. It, it's a, that's a, people don't like, some people like that, some people don't, but. Yeah, I'm just not sure how much money that would cost. I, like, I really have no yeah. idea. It sounds like it might be expensive. And, 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 I, and I'm really interested to try and get electronic door locks. I think it, I don't know if it works, but. I mean, that would be awesome. I I really want to put electronic door locks on these, two. these rooms right. because that's going to make the administration of this room so right. much easier. Right. Um, so so you, you could put electronic door locks, including the community room, just as a, I mean, it's part of our running that Part of our running that office is running this space, and and I know. Yeah, we I, I I agree. I think the two are, are intertwined. Yeah. And 
we would obviously start off with an electronic door lock on that door since it's, it's hard. So to those do. are the big, and we should put a copier machine down. Of course, yeah. Scanner, copier. I'll leave off the fax part. <laughs> so we have TV, flat screen, whiteboard, filing cabinets, computers and disk storage, computer accessories, recording devices, security devices, electronic door locks, and copier scanner printer. Anything else? Um, well, other than, these are like the non-furniture things that I can think of. Um, I think that in the, in the interim, we should have some sort of a key lock box uh, for the administration of okay. uh, this room. And how about the, um, uh, what are we going to do for um, telephone and telephone recording device? We could go old school and have a device, or we could go, we're probably going to go modern technology. The question is, is what kind of device do we have? You're talking about an answering machine. I'm talking about some kind of answering machine, but some kind of physical device that, you know, drives the answering machine. Is it going to be a old desktop phone, or are we going to do it with cell phones? Or I, I would imagine it would be desktop. I mean, yeah, I think that's definitely the cheaper solution. So then we yeah. get to say, well, what what kind so of so phone slash answering machine? Yeah. Okay, this is getting good. I think. I'm just trying to think about sitting in my own office of what's there. You know, yeah, a, I am too. We, if it was my office would be, do you have a pencil sharpener? No. <laughs> um, pencil sharpener, yeah. Well, kidding. I think that kind of falls just under the general just office I'm, supplies. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so kidding. far down. Um, um, let's see. What are all their like, big ticket items? What's in here? We'll be able to come over here to access water, so we don't need that, or a refrigerator. Yeah, I don't think we um, need. It would just be temporary. Um, well, that big table's still in there, right? Or are they yeah. taking that out? They said they're taking it, but are the chairs gone? I don't know. I haven't looked in there. I haven't either. Yeah. So then, you know, part of that is... When we get desks, are we going to have desks or are we going to have a t are we going to have a, a table? I mean, that could be a decision. I would not do hope you? that we'd have both in that in that room. The table doesn't need to be as big as the one that was in there. Yeah. But again, yeah, that should be a conversation that we have when we have the the space in front of us so that we can use our spatial reasoning. Right. I think this is good though. I would recommend, or I would move that the committee direct me to prepare a report uh, that includes these and any other items that I can think of in the meantime. Right, and then we can consider how that fits in our current budget and then where we seek donated items. And That's right. I mean, you could get away with a design like shoving these tables together and you have a nice big you know, meeting table. You can break it apart. You can have workstations, but it's true. Kind of janky, but what's that? Kind of janky, but yeah. You, you know, know, in oh. our and and we've done that in what we call our media room at the auditor's office. One, we have a big table when we have the chairs around it. Yeah. And the other, we have it where it's the half the size of these table with six yeah. footers, and they okay. go long or they go short. Um, if they're nice and clean and more modern, then they work, but I don't know if that works for the intern environment and, uh, you know, having staff in there, if you're always sitting around a, a table. Yeah. It depends on how well we can do in the back room. If we can set up permanent workstations yeah, exactly. in the back room, yeah. that would be pretty cool to have yeah. the permanent workstations and have that be almost a meeting room with tables and chairs. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Can you read that motion back to us, Alicia? Oh. It says, motion that the committee direct Director Brandt to prepare a report that includes these and any other items. Cool. And, and bring it to the full board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I kind of stopped mid-sentence. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
That was, I made the set. He made the motion. I made the second. Yeah. All right. Suggestions for the next formation committee. Let's just well, go, I think it go over like what we should continue. Yeah. So probably GM. Yep. Um, revenue raising strategies. Okay. Hopefully we can get Director Thurlow in the room. Um, the guiding document. Okay. Um, sweet uh, tour space. Well, and I think we wanted to make the, we just wanted to have a special meeting instead of doing a tour where we had to walk yeah. over there because it would alleviate some confusion. I'll, I'll, I'll call Gina and, and ask her if we can get the keys Perfect. and then. That's great. Um, and then, um, let's see, we're good on the grant. Um, we might want to continue, uh, consider recommendations regarding administrative needs. Okay. Um, I'm trying to anticipate other things that could be uh, coming before us. So one of the oh, things... Well, the, um, I can give a report back about the uh, NEH grant. Once I, once I know when the workshop is. What's we don't the name of that grant? I'll, I'll let you know if, okay. if, if that's something that I think is necessary. Okay. But I don't know what the workshop's going to be. We'll see. <clears throat> So, so um, Ethan and I have worked on this, you know, the first couple of deposits and we haven't paid a bill yet. Does the, if there's certain internal controls we should work on, you know, like when I left town after Ethan made a deposit, there was nobody backing me up. And so the auditor deposited the money to a miscellaneous revenue account. It's just I didn't have any time. The next day I went in there and I had to do an entry to move it. But Ethan and I have also not talked about, you know, do we want to keep um, paper files on all deposits and all, you know, payment of bills? And so the question is, is that something that is a decision of the a recommendation coming from the formation committee or is it just something that he and I should work out I think it's it, something they it, do and him should work out. it's really a policy on record retention yeah and I just wonder if we should have a if we should consider a policy on record retention given that you work with him and also um, sit on this committee, I think it would be better that you and him work that out. Okay. Okay. I mean, my goal, my goal, because that was, you know, my goal in my former job is to electronically file everything we can, and the means are there with skin and attached today to do a much better job on record retention and not have all these crappy paper files everywhere. So, I mean, you know, and, and the record retention laws have changed sufficiently that really electronic records are acceptable because it used to be you had to keep, you know, like those yeah. claims for seven years and we had, you that's know, right. files full in the basement. So I'll, I'll, that's, that's just, I'll think of that that's as an issue. Water. Okay, anything else on the formation committee? Not that I can think of right now. Okay, cool. Motion to adjourn. Motion to uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Jake can go to his real job. <laughs> Are you an I, Bob? What? Are you an I? Yeah, I'm an I. <laughs>